And I'd invite you to give ear to the reading of God's Word. We're in Psalm 116 and uh, reading verses 1 through 15. I love the Lord because He hears my voice and my prayer for mercy. Because He bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. Death wrapped its ropes around me. The terrors of the grave overtook me. I saw only trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Please, Lord, save me. How kind the Lord is. How good He is. So merciful, this God of ours. The Lord protects those of childlike faith. I was facing death and He saved me. Let my soul be at rest again. For the Lord has been good to me. He has saved me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. And so I walk in the Lord's presence as I live here on earth. I believed in you, so I said, I am deeply troubled, Lord. In my anxiety, I cried out to you, these people are all liars. What can I offer the Lord for all he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and praise the Lord's name for saving me. I will keep my promises to the Lord in the presence of all his people. The Lord cares deeply when his loved ones die. I'd like to ask you if you would, uh, that we would pray together. Would you please join with me? Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is inspired, that you Lord, spoke through so many folks, so many faithful folks to deliver this faithful word to us. And we thank you that your word is alive and active, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, you can speak into our lives directly into our hearts and minds. And we'd like to pray, Lord, that that would happen because your word is life and light to us. Lord, speak into our lives and give us, Lord, we pray, the faith required to not just be hearers, but also doers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this morning we're continuing this series, uh, Finding Jesus in the Psalms. And and essentially we've been focusing on on seeing Jesus in the Psalms really from two perspectives. Uh, One is from the perspective of prophetic revelation. That is, that we see in the Psalms, God giving, especially to David, giving prophetic insight unto the coming of Christ. So, for instance, I I recommended everybody uh, to go back and review Psalm 22 and to see how in amazing detail the Lord reveals what what Jesus is going to go through on the cross for us and the victory that he is going to win. It's amazing. Hundreds and hundreds of years before the coming of Jesus, we have those details recorded in Psalm 22. 22. Uh, We looked last week at Psalm 110, uh, a psalm of David. David receives this promise from God that he's going to have someone on the throne. There is going to be a Davidic king that will be an everlasting, an eternal king, right? And so in Psalm 110, God's giving him this prophetic insight that not only will this king be in his lineage, will be a son of David, but that he will also be the Lord. And the, the, the word that we use to describe the reality that God reveals there is what we call the incarnation, that Jesus is human, right? He is a human born in the line of David, but also he is God. He is the son of God come in the flesh. And we talked about the implications of that for how God loves us, how he must love us to be willing to do that for us. So we talked about prophetic revelation, and, and we've also talked about the more relational aspects of the revelation of Jesus in the Psalms. So, for instance, we talked about Psalm 23, that in, in Psalm 23, David is giving praise to God for this amazing relationship that he has with the Lord, how the Lord shepherds his life, how the Lord leads him and guides him and protects him, and how the Lord will welcome him into his eternal home, right? Right? And, and then, when we see in, in the Gospel of John, Jesus say, I am the good shepherd, what we understand is Jesus saying, I am the fulfillment of Psalm 23. This is who I am. This is who I want to be 
in your life. And, and so today, as we're looking at Psalm 116, we're really, I, I think, leaning harder into that relational aspect this morning. We're meeting Jesus uh, in Psalm 116, and, and we're seeing revealed there, Him reveal Himself there, uh, the way I, I would say it, and that's what I called this sermon today, uh, is that Jesus is revealing Himself there as the attentive Savior. Revealing Himself as the attentive Savior. And what's really interesting is that you can see the attentiveness of the Savior in David's response. A lot of Psalm 116 that you were hearing was David's response to God's love and grace and mercy in his life. And so you can see how the Savior is caring for him even as he's responding. And, and what we're seeing there then between the Lord's movement in his life, his love and grace in his life, and David's response is this beautiful relationship between David and his Savior. And I, and I think what we've got here is this is this beautiful vision of a relationship with God, of a life lived together with God. And, and so I, I'd like to jump into this. And what I'm hoping, uh, and I know that I can't do this, um, I can't do this fully. Uh, I can do it only incompletely and imperfectly. But what I'm praying the Holy Spirit will do is to paint a picture, to give us all a vision for this beautiful life with God this beautiful life with our attentive Savior. And so first of all, what we see in David's response is this declaration of love. There is this declaration of love. And what I want to do is call your attention to what I think is the key word in, uh, in this statement, in this declaration of love. He says, I love the Lord because He hears my voice. Do you hear the because? I love the Lord because He hears my voice. Because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. And so he loves the Lord, not because David is somehow of nobler character, not because he's more spiritually insightful than anybody else, not because someone's told him, hey, this is a good idea for your life. You should really love the Lord. He doesn't love the Lord for any of those reasons. He loves the Lord because of what the Lord has done in his life. How, how the Lord has reached into his life with his love and his grace and his mercy. He loves the Lord because the Lord hears my voice and, and my prayer for mercy. Because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. Do you know, um, one of the things that I think sometimes we in the church, and I don't just mean this church, I mean, I mean like the church, Big C Church. One of the things I think we get wrong is is we miss the sense of wonder and amazement at the grace of God. Let's think specifically about prayer. How is it that we think and, and, and talk and discuss about prayer? I mean, lots of times what we do, right, we say, this is the way you pray. This is the things, these are the things we think maybe you ought to pray about. And this is, this is the stuff that we think we can expect from prayer. And, and all of that's really interesting and all that's really great. But, but we miss... <laughs> we miss the sense of awe and wonder that we can actually pray at all. I mean, have you ever thought about that? Like, God doesn't have to listen to us. <laughs> he doesn't. And not only that, especially it's true that God doesn't have to listen to a bunch of sinners, right? Which we are. <laughs> God does not have to listen to us. There is no reason in ourselves that our prayers should get above the ceiling. That is just true. And I think there is, there is so much more vitality and, and life in our faith when we look with awe and wonder at the goodness of God. David says, he bends down to listen. And listen, the image here is of someone on a sickbed, right? That's, this, this kind of paints this picture. Someone who's on a sickbed and they're so... They are so sick, they are so weak that they can't get up and they can't project their voice. And so, and so someone has to come to them and has to bend down and turn their ear to the lips of the person who's in need because this person wouldn't be able to project their voice, wouldn't be able to get their, their requests, their thoughts to this other person. You see that? Can you see that image, right? This is the image of God coming to David. David knows, I can't get my prayers above the ceiling, but God has come to me to hear my prayers. And it, it causes him to be in awe 
and wonder. You know, there are those, uh, those childhood memories uh, that are burned into your consciousness. You, you know what I'm talking about? Those that, that you, you go back to time and time again, and sometimes you're reminded of. I was reminded of, of this, this time when, when I was a little boy, and, and I was so sick. It was probably the sickest I'd ever been. And I'm laying in bed, and I am, I am just, I feel so bad. I don't even feel like I can get out of bed. And my voice, ironically, is hoarse, right? And, and so I can't project, and I'm, I'm calling, Mom, Mom, Mom. And my brother, my older brother, of course, is right above me in a bunk bed, and he's completely worthless, right? I don't, I don't know what he's doing. He's probably, you know, waiting for me to die so he can have his own room or something. And, uh, and, I, and I, am just, I am just beside myself. I'm so upset because I'm so sick, and, and I'm despairing because I think, you know, nobody's ever going to know. And I will tell you, I, I am convinced I am convinced that it was the Holy Spirit that he tapped my mom on the shoulder and said, hey, you need to go check on Jeremy because the next thing I know, and it wasn't because my voice was strong enough to call her, the next thing I know, she's there, right? And I think it's a little bit like what David experienced with the Lord. It's like, I, I know, I can't, get, I can't get my prayers up above the ceiling. I can't do it. But I'm crying out to him and crying out to him. And in a moment, he is aware, the Lord's here. He hears my prayer. He has bent down to listen to me. And therefore, he says, I just love God so much. He is so good to me. He is so good to me. And and I, I couldn't help but think about this woman who in awe and wonder and love and gratitude Bust into a dinner party. You remember the woman who came into that dinner party that, where Jesus was a guest? And she risked ridicule and embarrassment and the whole deal. She risks it so that she can go in and fall at His feet. And I mean, she grabs a hold of His feet and she is weeping. You remember this? She is weeping. Why is she weeping? Because she is so grateful. She's not sad. She's weeping in gratitude because of what the Lord has done in her life. His forgiveness over her. And this is how Jesus talks about her. He says, I tell you her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. Right? She doesn't love me, and therefore I forgive her. I have forgiven her. And that's why she loves me, right? So we love because he first loved us. And I think a real important question for us, and I, and I think this is very important for all of us, is when we think about our Savior, when we think about what he's done in our lives, do our hearts surge? Do our hearts surge with awe and love and gratitude because of how good he has been to us when we think about him and all that he has done? And friends, if not, let me just, let me just implore you to go to Jesus and allow him to forgive your sins and open your heart to him so that he would give you the gift of the Holy Spirit that the scripture says will shed the love of God abroad in your heart. You will experience in your body the love of Jesus And you will know, because the Bible says it, you will know in your heart that you are His and His forever. right? Forever. Now, the first thing then in this beautiful vision of a life with God is this declaration of love. We love Him because He first loved us. We are in awe and wonder at His love. Second thing we see in His response here that I think is so important is, is that He determines that this is a relationship worth pursuing. It is a relationship to pursue. David says, And so I walk in the Lord's presence as I live here on earth. I believed in you. So I said, I am deeply troubled, Lord. Now, uh, of course, there's a sense in which everybody on the entire planet is in the presence of God, right? Because there is nowhere where the presence of God is not. But there's a huge difference. There's a world of difference between being in God's presence and being in God's manifest presence. That, those, are, those are worlds apart. Being in the presence of God where we acknowledge God, where we experience Him, experience His love and His presence in our lives. Uh, years ago, 
I think I told some of y'all this story before. Uh, years ago, I, I got to go to an Orlando Magic game. There was a family in the church. They had these corporate tickets. They were really amazing tickets. We were literally on the fourth row. I had no idea how large these guys actually were. It was, it was amazing. I thought they were like this big, but actually they're life size. And, uh, and it was just, it was amazing. And I am there just taking it all in. I'm smiling like an idiot. I mean, just, I'm just having a blast. Well, come to find out, people told me who were watching on TV, uh, the governor, who at that time was Jeb Bush, so that'll give you an idea of when this was, right? The governor came in and sat, literally sat right behind me, right? And, and so <laughs> the commentators are like, oh, the governor of Florida just came in, and, and, and people at home told me they were trying to get a camera angle, right? And, and I was just... And so all they got was me. And, and see, I had no idea he was there. And, and, and if I had known, right, his presence would have made a difference. I, I would have tried really hard not to look like an idiot. Um, but, but I did. And so, um, but for David, the presence of the Lord in his life doesn't just make a difference. It makes all the difference. All the difference. He is able to say to his soul, let my soul be at rest again, for the Lord has been good to me. Let my soul be at rest. You know, um, the other day I was, I was talking to Linda uh, Rooting, and don't tell her I ever said that she was right. Um, just keep that between us. <laughs> but I was talking to Linda, and uh, I was talking about stuff that God was doing in my life, and in my family's life, and in our church family, and and, uh, and I was just struck, and I just stopped, and I said, you know, um, I just don't know why God is so good to me. And she said, and, and she was right, she said, well, he loves you, right? He loves you. And I think that if we could live in that awareness every day, every moment, I think that we would be able to instruct our souls, our anxious souls, and say, be at rest again, my soul. For the Lord has been good to me. I mean, think about how good the Lord has been to us. Romans 8.32, Since He did not spare even His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, won't He also give us everything else? God has provided for us a means of forgiveness and reconciliation to Him to be at peace with God. God has given us, He has given us, secured for us our eternal salvation in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so it's like, if he did that for us, where is he going to leave us hanging? I mean, really, what do we need that he will fail to give us when he has already given us the most precious thing, the most valuable thing in the entire world, in the entire universe? He's already given us his son. And so what you see is this this call that sort of echoes through the Old Testament and on into the New to trust in the Lord, to trust in His love. 1 Peter 5, 7, give all your worries and cares to God. Why? For He cares about you. So we can leave our souls in His care. David says, the Lord cares deeply when His loved ones die. And, it, and that can seem kind of random here, like it's just sort of inserted, and what does that have to do with all the rest of this? But I tell you the, the truth, there is one particular way that is amazing that God could still give us rest, give rest to our souls in, and that is the greatest anxiety that any of us will ever face, and that is what David calls the terrors of the grave. That is a real thing. The terrors of the grave. That even facing the terrors of the grave, that we can instruct our souls, be at rest, my soul. For the Lord has been good to me. Be at rest, my soul, for there is, the Word tells us, an eternal inheritance for us. For those who are in Christ, there is an eternal inheritance that is kept safe in heaven for us. And even between now and then, we have such amazing assurance that the Lord is attentive to our lives. He cares about our death. He actually cares when we die. And I love the way Charles Spurgeon, maybe you all have heard of him, he's, he, he's, he was called the Prince of Preachers, right? And, and I love the way he talks about this verse. He says, The Lord values the lives of His saints and often spares them where others perish. 
They shall not die prematurely. They shall be immortal till their work is done. And when their time shall come to die, then their deaths shall be precious. The Lord watches over their dying beds, smooths their pillows, sustains their hearts, and receives their souls. Let my soul be at rest again, for the Lord has been good to me. Now, last thing, um, in this beautiful vision of a life with God, what we see is, is from David, this commitment to live. This commitment to live. He says, what can I offer the Lord for all He's done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and praise the Lord's name for saving me. I will keep my promises to the Lord in the presence of all His people. What, what's this about? This, this cup of salvation. Well, listen, um, David has this impulse because he knows, and we, we all know this, that we can't pay God back for what He's done for us. We, we can't. But there is this impulse in us to want to do something for God. To want to do something for Him. What can I do for the Lord? And the way, the way David answered is so gospel revealing. Is so gospel centered. Because what he is inspired, how he is inspired to respond is he says, I will lift up the cup of salvation. You know, in, in the scriptures, there are these two cups. right? These, this metaphor, these two cups. There is the cup of the wrath of God. That there is this judgment that's coming upon humankind. And, and those who are wicked and those who reject God will fall under the wrath of God. That's what, that's what the Word says. And the image is that, that there is this cup of wrath that's going to be poured out. right? But now, hold on to that and then, and then go with Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane and hear what He says to His Heavenly Father, to our Heavenly Father. He says, My Father, if it is possible, do you remember? He says, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not, not what I will, but yet what you will, your will be done. What's he talking about? He's talking about the cup of the wrath of God. He says, if there's another way, if there is another way that, that people can be saved apart from me having to drink the cup of the wrath of God, let's do that. And yet, Knowing what He faced, He knew what He was going to face. Jesus on the cross drinks the cup of the wrath of God and He drinks it all the way down to the dregs. That is to say that He takes the fullness of our sin upon Himself so that we will not face the cup of wrath, but so that we will have instead the cup of salvation. The cup of salvation. And I'm not sure what else David could mean here when he says that he'll lift up the cup of salvation other than, other than that he's saying that he will drink in the fullness of the salvation of God. He will drink in the fullness of the salvation of God. Jesus did not die just to get us a ticket to heaven. He died so that we could be restored, healed, redeemed. There are things in our lives, sin and fear. There are things in our lives that are thieves that steal the abundance of life that God wants for us. And Jesus came to free us from them all. When the Son sets us free, we are free indeed. Right? And so David says, I'm going to lift up the cup of salvation. I'm going to drink fully of the salvation of our God. And so he says, I, I'm going to praise God. I'm going to stand in awe and wonder of His love. And I'm going to keep my promises to the Lord in the presence of all His people. David commits his life to the Lord. Not because he's trying to, by his obedience, earn God's love, but because he already has it, you see. Because he already has it. And so let us determine that we are going to lift up the cup of salvation. We will leave none of it left, none of it behind. We will drink fully of the restorative work of Jesus in our lives. We will labor because we know God is working in us to be the new creations that Jesus died to enable us to be. Amen? Amen. If you would, let's, let's please pray together. Lord, we do give You thanks and praise because You are so very attentive to us. You, you bend down to listen to us. And we're so grateful. We're in awe of Your love and care. We, we know that just 
the fact that we can pray is such a sign of your goodness to us. And so, Lord, we ask that you would enable us to keep our eyes, to keep our awareness fixed on how good you are and how good you are to us so that we can say to our souls, be at rest again. Be at rest again. And Lord, we ask that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, enable us to lift up the cup of salvation. We don't want to just play around, God. We don't want to just take part of your blessing. We want to take the fullness of salvation. We want to be new creations in Christ. May it be so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.